All right, we got a lot to cover tonight in Matthew chapter number five. Of course, this is famously known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's going to continue through chapter six and chapter seven, where Jesus Christ is just giving just this great, awesome sermon and lots and lots of great truths coming in here. And if you remember from last week at the very end of chapter four, that was when Jesus Christ was healing a lot of people that were like possessed with devils and had, you know, real major diseases and sicknesses and stuff. And as a result of all that healing, he ended up having this multitude then following him because he was doing so much good work and obviously turning a lot of heads and getting a lot of attention through all the healing that was going on and the people that he was reaching. So at the end of verse number four, verse 25, it says, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So people are just kind of amassing from all over the place locally, just, just following Jesus Christ at this point in his ministry. And it said in chapter five starts off saying, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. So there's a lot of people. I mean, it's multitudes. So he's going up into this mountain to be able to project his voice a little bit, to be able to preach to this whole mass of people, these multitudes that have, that have gathered together to hear Jesus Christ and is to follow him and to be by him and, you know, uh, see what he's all about. So he goes up into this mountain and says, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, and then he just continues on. So the narrator is done now for the whole rest of the chapter. And now the rest of it is going to be Jesus Christ just preaching all the way through to the end. And this section that we're going to be reading right now is known as the Beatitudes and nothing really special about that other than it's just kind of a fancy name if you ever hear anyone talk about the beatitudes it's just this section where he's talking about blessed are the poor blessed are the weak meek blessed are you know the the blessings basically is the beatitudes it's it's all these blessings that he's giving at this point and um we'll go through these um kind of quickly there's just there's so much to cover here there's like entire sermons packed into a few verses just all throughout this chapter so uh, i'm going to do my best to get through this in a reasonable amount of time tonight but um let's take a look at some of these and and what i really want you to just kind of focus on and what he's saying this is all just made to these blessings are designed to exhort people and to encourage people who are kind of beat down in this world people who might be trying to live what the right life but they don't have all the riches. They don't have everything made. They don't have their life just set. They're going through some struggles and they're going through some hard times. And basically what Jesus is doing with all of these blessings is just saying, hey, you know what? You're blessed. Hey, you're blessed. Hey, look up. You're blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's saying, you know, your, your spirit's run down. Your spirit's poor. Blessed are you. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, go through hard times, sad times, you know, you're grieving. You're blessed, Jesus says, why? Because you're going to be comforted. Blessed are the meek, meek, lowly, humble people, not all lifted up in themselves, not all lifted up in pride. Why? For they shall inherit the earth. See, it's usually the proud people that will boast about all of their goods and all of their belongings and how much they have and how powerful they are. He says, you know what? Don't be like them. Don't be like these jerks that just have these big heads and these big egos and think they have everything. You just be meek. And you know what? Sometimes being meek means you're suffering things that the arrogant people are throwing your way, right? They want to trample all over you and use you. And a lot of this chapter, we're going to see even later, too, he's teaching about how to deal with that later on in the chapter. And he says, yeah, the meek, you know what? You're going to inherit the earth. This is all going to be yours. Verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I love the way that he says that. They're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. You want to do what's right. You want to know what's right. You just have this desire and this yearning for righteousness. Do you have that attitude? 
Jesus said, blessed are those people that you're just, you're just thirsting after. I'm hungry. Man, that's what I want. I want righteousness. I want to do what's right. I want to know what's right. And he says, why? For they shall be filled. Jesus will give that to you. you is that your desire? Is that what you want? Amen. God will let you have that. Verse number seven, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's a blessing to be merciful to people, to, be, to have forgiveness, to not just, just be hard on everything and, oh, you did me wrong and that's it and you're not going to you know, show any mercy. God says, no, when you show mercy, then when you find yourself in a situation where you'd like to have some mercy, guess what? You'll receive it because you're going to reap what you sow. And that's ultimately what he's <laughs> regarding here. People are reaping what they sow. And when they're sowing good things and when they, they're focused on the right things, then the good things are going to end up, they're going to end up being blessed with. Verse number eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Keeping that purity in your heart. You want to know God? You want to come face to face with God? You want to see God? It comes from being pure in heart and having that right heart and, and wanting to get close to God. Verse number nine, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And we are supposed to live as much as lieth in us peaceably with all men. That is what the Christian is, 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 is supposed to be doing. Our goal isn't to go out and, and just get into fights and cause problems with people. Now, we definitely will stand on the word of God all day long. And if the fight comes to us, then, hey, we're standing. We're not backing down. We'll be right up in this fight. But at the same time, it's not like we have this goal and this agenda to just intentionally you know, get people riled up and stirred up and just cause a bunch of chaos and problems. That's not what we're trying to do. But if you're preaching God's word and that happens as a result, then so be it. Right? Well, that, that's on other people. But, but our attitude, our spirit, our heart is one that says, no, we, we want peace. I want to live peaceably. We're trying to make peace. I want everyone to, to read the Bible and get saved and follow the word of God. Amen. That would be great. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When, when you're doing right, and not just doing right, but you're, you're persecuted because you're doing right. For righteousness' sake. Just for the sake of you doing what's right, people will persecute you. And that happens. And the Bible says when that happens, Jesus says, you know what? You're blessed. Because you've got an inheritance. You have an inheritance in heaven. Now, all of this is geared towards believers. I mean, he was speaking to his disciples when, when you know, the chapter starts off. It says his disciples came unto him. Now, granted, there are multitudes here, but he's preaching to his disciples. So this isn't, you know, obviously he's, he's referring to the kingdom of heaven multiple times. This isn't talking about like a works-based salvation. This is talking about people receiving things, especially here you know, hey, you're going to have these rewards in the kingdom of heaven when you're persecuted because you're doing right. This is what he's referring to. He's encouraging his disciples to stay with it. Verse number 11, he goes further to say, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And I can't understate this enough. I can't, you know, underscore, excuse me. I can't, I can understate it. I don't want to understate it. I can't underscore this enough, especially today. We've got people that just have this stupid attitude that being a Christian somehow means that the world's going to love you. And that, oh, well, if the sheriff department comes out against you, then of course you're obviously wrong. Well, if, you know, Cracker Barrel comes out against you, which by the way, the Cracker Barrel came out against Pastor Fritz and denied him and his church just the ability to eat in their facility, refusing service to a church group, just won't even serve them. 
They didn't go there to preach. They didn't go there to hold an event and to, you know, proselytize to the entire Cracker Barrel staff. They didn't go there to, to you know, preach against sodomy. They're trying to, they go there to try to eat a, eat a meal. Banned. Banned from the Cracker Barrel. But those, the, yeah, it's terrible, huh? <laughs> oh, no, where are we going to eat? Second-rate food for a high price. Sorry if I offended you if you like the Cracker Barrel, but... <laughs> But this is the mindset of the world. And not just the world, but this supposedly Christian world, right? I would be willing to bet that the, that the Cracker Barrel has some affiliation with being Christian, kind of like Chick-fil-A does or whatever. I would, I, and I don't know that for a fact. I would just guess because they're this old country store and all this, you know, old-fashioned type of, of Southern cooking and Southern hospitality and all that, except when it comes to people who actually believe and preach the Bible, then no, we have nothing to do with you. Well, fine, Cracker Barrel. We, we don't have anything to do with you either. <laughs> you know, whatever. But this is that attitude. And what Jesus is saying here is that you're going to be reviled and persecuted. You know what? But you're actually blessed. So when you're doing what's right, when people are saying all manner of evil against you falsely for his sake, which is exactly what's happening to Pastor Fritz, which is exactly what's happening to Pastor Boyle right now. Why? Because they're standing on the Word of God. They're preaching God's Word as it is written. Just for what it says. They're not adding and spinning and twisting things off. They're literally reading the Bible and believing it literally. And preaching it. That's what it says. Leviticus 20.13 still says what it says. It hasn't changed and it doesn't need any interpretation. It means exactly what it said when it was written. What it meant when it was written, it means the same thing today. It has the same meaning. And God feels the same way about it. Why is that so hard for people to get through their skulls? But this is nothing new. And Jesus is trying to explain this and saying, hey, you're blessed when people say all manner of evil against you falsely for his sake. Right? Things you don't even do. And they're trying, they're trying to accuse Pastor Fritz. Oh, now we have to go back and look at all these cases where these homos were tried and prosecuted. No, you don't need to look at them because they're probably guilty because they're filled with all unrighteousness anyways. Right. He was just doing his job. He's not allowing, you know, they're, they're basically just accusing him of not having integrity, which the man has integrity. But they're reviling and persecuting and saying all manner of evil against it. But it's false. And the whole purpose is because of what he preaches. But you know what? He's blessed. According to Jesus, these men are blessed. And he goes further to say, you know, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Hey, be happy about that. I'm, I'm thrilled that Jesus writes this teaching because for anyone that goes through this, it's not a pleasant feeling in your flesh to go through people saying all manner of evil against you falsely. That's not a pleasant experience to get from people harassing you, hounding you, sending you all these messages, mail, you know, harassing your family, harassing everyone you know, not, you know, not letting you into places, and all of this stuff. That's not a good feeling. But Jesus said, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Wow. Why? Because he sees all of the wrong and for as much wrong as you go through and you take that patiently and you go through that, Jesus says, <laughs> I've got a lot more waiting for you Amen. on the other side. I'm going to make amends. I'm going to make it right. That's good. And he says, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. All the prophets of God all of them have gone through persecution. All of the prophets have suffered at some point in their lives. They've suffered persecution. They've done things wrong. Why? Because if, they, if they're following Christ, if they're following the Lord, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That statement isn't just true for the New Testament. That statement has been true all throughout history. And that's why he says, hey, be... 
Be happy. Why? Because the prophets that came before you, the prophets, the minor prophets, the major prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament, they were also persecuted. It's actually way more of a sign. If you want to know if, if someone is preaching the truth and is a man of God, it's a lot more likely when you see someone that's being hated on by the world that that person's a man of God than the one that everybody loves and that the president invites over and that they have all these, you know, the one that's on all the TV shows and the channels where they're just, oh, so good to have you and, and welcoming and not, you know, and not just trying to bring their name through the mud. The ones that actually are getting their names brought through the mud, you can probably bet that's probably a man of God. Now, that's not the only way to tell because you got some real weirdos out there, but... You know, there's when when this is happening for someone who's preaching the word of God, he says that's exactly what they did to the prophets before you. And this is encouraging because it reminds us that, you know what, there's a reward in heaven. And if Jesus is telling me that I'm blessed, I don't care. I don't care how many people curse me. I don't care who curses me. If Jesus says, I'm going to be blessed with these things, then I will take solace and comfort in that, and yea, even rejoice. Amen. And rejoice greatly. Rejoice exceedingly. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So right after he's done giving these encouraging words, right, to hang in there, you're blessed. You're going to have this great reward. He then goes on to warn them and say, hey, look, disciples, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor. Basically, what's a savor? It's basically like the flavor. Okay? You use salt to season things, to, to season up meat, to season up the food that you're eating to make it taste a little bit better. Right? Now, I know there's preservative as well in salt, but he's specifically here just talking about the salt losing its, its flavor. Right? So if you're putting salt on your food to make it taste a little bit better for you, and you're putting salt on, and you're just like, this didn't do anything. What are you going to do with that salt? Are you going to keep it around and be like, well, maybe next time it'll taste a little bit different? No, you, this, this is useless now. If it isn't going to make me, my food taste any better, I'm throwing it in the trash. And that's the warning. He's saying, you know what? You're the salt of the earth. But beware, because if the salt of the lost is savor, savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. And ultimately what he's warning about, and we're going to get into this even further, if you're not doing and living your life the way that God wants you to, as the salt of the earth, as these believers, as God's disciples, as Jesus' disciples, you're not going to taste that good unto him anymore. You're just going to be like, well, what, what, are you, what are you even doing here then? Why are you here on this earth? Why are you just taking up space and breathing air and doing stuff if you're not doing anything with your life? If you're not doing anything to serve the Lord, yeah, you're saved, but you're neither, you're neither cold nor hot. Because you're neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Amen. And, and this is a concept that's taught throughout Scripture, too. You know, he gives parables. Well, well, why does this, you know, he talks about the tree. Well, why does this cumber the ground anymore? If you've got a tree, it's just not producing any fruit. He's saying, well, what, what good is it then? I mean, I have this tree planted. I want it to bring forth fruit. If it's not bringing forth any fruit, well, let's just chop it down and throw it in the fire then because that's all it's good for. It's just going to be good for wood. If you're not doing anything with your life, if you're not going to bear fruit, if you're not going to be the salt of the earth, if you're not going to live the way that God wants you to, he's saying, watch out. Because then what good is your life? What good is it for you to even be here? What good is it for God to, to maintain your breath on this earth? Verse number 14, he continues on the same thought. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Disciples, your life is one that's supposed to be out there in the public eye. You are a light. 
What does the light do? It shines. And he makes reference to a city that's on a hill, right? You can't hide a city on a hill. Why? Because it's lifted up and everyone can see it from all around. You can't hide that. So he's equating you and your life. He's saying you shouldn't just be hiding your faith. You shouldn't be hiding who you are. You should be letting that light shine. You should be like the salt. You should be good for something. Verse number 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So you're saying, you know, when people light a candlestick, the whole purpose of that is to provide light within the house, Right? Oh, it's dark outside. We want to see. We want to read. We want to talk. We want to do more things while it's dark outside. So let's light the candlestick. And you don't put it underneath like a bush, you know, a, a bushel, uh, uh, you know, cover it up with something like, OK, we've got the candlestick lit. Now let's just make sure none of the light shines anywhere in the house. That's ridiculous. Of course, you're not going to do that. In the same manner, he's saying, let your light shine. You have a light within you. You have Christ in you. If you're a believer, if you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit of God residing within you. Let that spirit out. Let that come out through your deeds, through your actions, through your voice. He's saying, let your light so shine before men, not in secret. Let your light shine before men. Everyone ought to know about it, that they may see your good works. So what's he talking about when he says your light? Your good works. That you're living righteously, that you're doing right. This ties in with the salt. It's the same thing. It's the same message. And why should they see your good works? That they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's not to lift you up. Your good works being shown before men is not for your glorification, but the Father's. Why? Because He's the one who made the law. Your good works should be in accordance to God's law. So when someone sees you obeying the commandments, obeying God's word and, and living a life that, that coincides with what the scripture says, that gives glory unto the Father. Why? Because you're recognizing something else. You're choosing to say, you know what, I'm going to live this way because I respect God. That's how God gets the glory and the credit and the honor. And if someone asks you, well, why do you do this? Why don't you watch TV? Why do you dress that way? Why? You know, why? Because the Bible. Because God. Not because I want to look good in everyone else's eyes, it's because, because God said so. That gives glory unto God. Look at verse number 17. Another passage that the haters just, just need to, to read, other than, you know, like Matthew 7 1. They, they need to come back and read Matthew. Because before you get to Matthew 7, you got to read through Matthew 5. Earlier in Jesus' ministry, he's not doing away with this by chapter 7, by the way, which is all part of the same sermon. He's not just doing away with this. He says in chapter 5 or 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Oh, but, but you're a Christian. You're new, you should believe the New Testament. What about the New Testament? The Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. The law, the books of Moses. The prophets, the rest of the Old Testament. Are we doing away with that stuff now because we're in the New Testament? Nope. Is it just destroyed? Oh, Leviticus 20 and 13, that's, that's just the Old Testament, but we don't live in the Old Testament anymore. We live in the New Testament now. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Don't think that. That's a stupid thought. That is a foolish thought to think that just because Jesus Christ came that the law is null and void. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus kept the law. He came, I came to follow the law. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Has heaven and earth passed yet, by the way? Because I think we still are on the earth right now. It hasn't passed away, right? In the past 2,000 years, it's still been going. Okay, make sure I didn't miss anything. Till heaven and earth pass. So it hasn't passed yet. One jot... Or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law 
to all be fulfilled. Has all been fulfilled? If all hasn't been fulfilled, has one jot or one tittle then passed from the law? No. Pretty simple, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I have this, you know, I had to go, uh, I guess I'm thankful I didn't go to semin seminary because then I might not have been able to actually just read a passage like this and have such an amazing exposition of the passage that I could look at these words and say, well, wait a minute, has heaven and earth passed? No? Okay, then one jot and one tittle hasn't passed from the law. I know, it's difficult. And if you go to seminary, they might try to tell you, no, that's not actually what it means. I mean, if you understand the culture, if you understand the times, and this Greek word here, really, it's, it doesn't mean that. And, you know, if you were there around that time and what the people thought, and it was just a totally different culture. You'd have to understand, they didn't have these same concepts and they didn't have the science that we have today, so their understanding was completely different. And what this really means is that actually the law has passed away. <laughs> and this is what people do that don't want to believe God's word. And they call it theology and they'll try to puff themselves up as being so smart and I'm so academic and oh, we could have a debate over this and you simpleton, you don't know, you know, you think you could exposit the beatitude so perfectly. You, so, you ignorant fool. Go get your master's in divinity and then come back and speak to me. It's not complicated, folks. The common man went to hear Jesus Christ and you know what? They heard him. You know who didn't hear him? The Pharisees. The ones who had all the scholarly education and they had the PhDs and men just looked up to them and extolled them as being these academics. But it was people like Peter and James and John from whence knew these men letters. Where did they know how to read and write? Where did they get their, their education from? Hey, but they spent time with Jesus. Jesus taught them. They didn't need to get that from their school. He taught them and they understood it. They're not these amazing scholars. Don't worry about what these fools do. And, and ultimately, the whole point of these, this foolishness and this, you know, uh, the apologetics and everything else, they just want to, to sound like they really know what they're talking about in order to just undermine what the Bible clearly states. They want to take the verses that they don't like and try to provide some other explanation as to what this actually means. No, it actually means what it actually says. Amen. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist or even a theologian to understand the book. It just takes the Spirit of God residing inside of you, which is why so many of those false prophets, you know, they're not even saved. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. It's the Spirit of God that discerns and understands the spiritual things of God. This is a spiritual book which is why when you're saved, it's not really that hard to understand it. I'm not saying you're going to have total 100% perfect knowledge of everything that's written in the Word of God, inside and out. Of course not. It's an infinite book. But at the same time, just because you can't understand something infinitely doesn't mean that you can't just read what it says and understand the meaning and just believe it because it says it. Sorry, I had to get that off my chest. One jot, one tittle, not passing from the law. Verse number 19, and I love this verse. Verse number 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. This is Jesus Christ talking about keeping the commandments, even the small commandments. The least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Herein lies the irony with the people that want to call us, you Pharisee, you're a legalist, you, oh, you just look at the law, yo, why do you think you should have to follow the law and have to follow, so, <coughs> I 
Are you teaching that we shouldn't follow the least of the commandments? And is that what you're teaching me? That you don't obey it and you're going to teach me that? Well, nice to meet you, Mr. Least. Because that's what you're going to be called in the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. Anybody that breaks the smallest commandments and teaches other men, oh yeah, that's okay. Oh, you're not convicted of that? Don't worry about it. No big deal. You're least. And then the contrary side is, whosoever shall do and teach them. It doesn't just say do. It doesn't just say, well, the people who just follow it, but they don't ever say anything to anyone else because then that would be judgmental. It says, those that do them, yes, even the smallest commandments, and then teach other men, hey, we ought to be doing this. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is so confusing, I know. These are just really difficult concepts to get across. Jesus specifically teaching that people should be doing and teaching even the least of the commandments. Turn, if you would, real quick to Matthew 23, verse number 23. Modern lamestream Christianity points to people that actually promote God's laws and saying, hey, we should follow these. And, so, you know, they call those people Pharisees. Oh, you Pharisee. Well, what does Jesus think? In Matthew 23, this is an entire chapter practically dedicated to just ripping on the Pharisees. Obviously, the Pharisees aren't liked, which is why people want to give you the label of being a Pharisee, because Jesus condemned the Pharisees. So they think that by calling you a Pharisee, you're condemned. But see, they're mislabeling people who want to follow God's laws as being a Pharisee, because they think that that's how the Pharisees were. That's not how the Pharisees were. Amen. The biggest problem with the Pharisees is that they're hypocrites. That's why as Jesus is railing on them, like in every single verse of Matthew 23, he says, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. They're not three different groups. He's saying, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. And then explains why. And in verse number 23 of Matthew 23, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. So what he's saying is, look, you've paid tithe. They're either paying tithe on the smallest of things. Herbs, right? Mint. Use a little bit of mint when you prepare your food or whatever. Just these, these little bits, and they're paying tithes on that. That's like the smallest of the commandments, right? But what was, was their problem? Was that they were following the tithe that closely? Was that their problem? No, because Jesus said, these ought ye to have done. Yes, you ought to have done that. Yes, that's right to pay that much attention and detail to that. Like, do it right. The smallest of the commandments, yes, do that. But their problem was they just completely omitted the weightier matters of the law. Like, you just weren't doing this. Implying, first of all, because they're weightier, they're more important. And they are more important. What are the things he mentioned as being more important? The weightier matters of the law, the law being one of them, judgment, I thought we're not supposed to, to judge. Jesus said that's one of the major matters that, matters that they weren't doing. They didn't have righteous judgment. Why? Because they were hypocrites, as Matthew 7, as we, when we get to that, we'll see, they've got the beam in their eye, and they're hypocrites when they try to judge other people, which completely blinds them from having proper judgment. 
and they're in error. But they've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, and mercy and faith. Also, extremely important aspects that are way more important than are you tithing on the smallest amount of spices that you have in your cabinet or whatever that grow in your, in your garden, right? But he's saying, do both. You ought to do both. Pay attention to the least, but definitely pay attention to the greatest and keep that. But do it all. And teach men so. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. So the Pharisees were doing some things right. For the most part, no. For the most part, they just said and did not. They had some of these little things down, apparently, but just completely were backwards on what the most important stuff was. And the other thing is that they actually said some things that were right, but they didn't do them themselves. I mean, they're constantly being rebuked by Jesus for saying, hey, you know, he, he says, you know, the things they tell you to do, that do, but don't do the way, after their manner. Like, don't do the things that they do. The things that they say to do, yeah, do that. When they're teaching about Moses and, and, the, and the commandments and they're teaching you to obey those commandments, yes, do that. But they don't follow that. They're the ones that have all their special rules. And when you, when you get into the Pharisees, you'll see like, Jesus rebukes them for saying, well, they say, well, it's Corban, however you might be profited by me, making the commandment of God of none effect. When they're supposed to be honoring their father and their mother, which means taking care of them, providing for them when they get old. And they had an attitude. The Pharisaical attitude was, hey, you just consider it a gift, whatever I do for you. They were not legalistic. They were actually trying to circumvent the law and they completely made the commandment of God of none effect by their own traditions, by their own laws outside of the law of God. That's what they gave regard to, not God's law. So calling someone who actually believes and wants to follow all of God's law a Pharisee is ridiculous and doesn't fall in line with what the scripture says at all. That's also why they're trying to find out if they could divorce their wife for every cause. Well, can a man divorce his wife just for, for every cause? She's saying, no. No, they can't, you can't divorce your wife for every cause. And they're saying, well, then how come Moses suffered us to give her a bill of divorcement, huh? That's the Pharisaical attitude. It's, I want to look really religious in front of people, but I don't want to do any of it. That's the Pharisee. Big difference from the person who says, I want to follow and keep all of God's commandments. And you know what? I'm going to teach men to do the same thing. Doing and teaching. You know, when you do and teach, that you're not a hypocrite. When you do and teach, Matthew 7 isn't applying to you of having some beam in your eye because you're doing. When you're doing and judging, Righteous judgment. Verse number 20. Jesus says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the, the scribes and Pharisees were looked at as being very righteous by the people. Because they lived in, in, many, you know, in some cases like these separated lives. Not unto God, though. It was for their own pride and their own lifting up and everything else. But just as you can see, like, the Pope today, right, it's probably a great example of a Pharisee. Someone who has the long garment on and loves the greeting in the marketplace and loves when people bow down and kiss his ring and loves all the adoration and everything else. And people, many people just look to the, oh, wow, the Pope is so holy. The Pope is, I mean, the Pope. He's just amazing. This amazing man of God, right? Well, Jesus is saying, you know, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter in the kingdom of heaven. And that's true. See, the problem is that we're all sinners, 
And we don't have righteousness. We need the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed unto us, which far exceeds any man. No matter how much in your own eyes even you lift up certain people and you think, well, wow, they're so holy. Well, I mean, if I have to be more righteous than that, then how can I get into heaven? Well, you can't. Unless you have Jesus' righteousness imputed on you because you put your trust in him, because you believed on him. Then you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which, yes, that is enough to get you in. And to help you understand this a little bit more, too, just what he's talking about with, um, turn real quick to Philippians chapter 3. Jesus is not preaching a works-based salvation here. Saying, oh, well, you just need to be really righteous. Because you do have to be really righteous. It's just not through your own righteousness. It's through the righteousness of Christ. But the Pharisees were viewed as being very righteous because they did things like paying tithes on the smallest of things. And people would see that and be like, oh, you know, wow, look at how holy they are because they're even doing that, right? But they couldn't see <laughs> there, there are wicked hearts and what they're actually not doing, right? Uh, um, that's not in front of people. Um, but the Apostle Paul kind of gives a little insight into this pharisaical mindset also. In Philippians 3, you know, he's basically saying, you know what? Hey, you think you have somewhere to glory of? You think you could boast? You think you could boast in how righteous you are and how good you are? He's like, well, me more. He's like, yeah, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And, he's, and he goes and like refers to his life as a Pharisee and how righteous of a Pharisee he was. But of course, he understood and learned that that doesn't accomplish you anything and that that righteousness is just like filthy rags in the eyes of God. He counts it but dung because it's all about Christ. Let's look at verse number four in Philippians chapter three. He says, though I, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He said, no, you think you could trust in your flesh. You think that you're just righteous person. You know what? I have more right to brag than you do. And then he goes on, he says, circumcised the eighth day. So right from the bat, right in line with the law. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a pure blood Benjamite. And Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, Pharisee. So he's saying, I wasn't like one of these Sadducees that are real loose with their interpretation of everything. No, no, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Hey, you want to talk about being zealous? I went out there. I went after these people. I persecuted the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, is he saying that he was just absolutely perfect and not a sinner? No. But this is the mindset. He, I mean, hey, I was doing everything that the Pharisees were supposed to do because they had the bar set a lot lower, for one, because that's what everybody who trusts in a works-based salvation always has the bar set low for something that you can actually achieve as opposed to God's standard, which is perfection, and nobody can achieve that. And then he says in verse 7, he follows all that up with, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All these areas where he thinks he'd be able to boast in, that's actually loss for Christ because you have no room to boast at all. All glory, all praise goes unto Jesus Christ. Everything is by him. All the work was done by him. None of it is of yourself. So even these things where you might want to think and say, you could have done these, you know what, that's all just loss for the cause of Christ because I don't even want to have it appear that I've done to work my way in heaven because I can't. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Following, continuing on with Jesus' teachings of, no, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And, and he, you know, because he started off saying, hey, be the salt, be the light, let men see your good works. He wants you doing the good works. He wants you following the law. He warns us about it. He says, you know what? Keep the smallest of the laws. Teach men to do that. That's going to make you great in the kingdom of heaven. And now he's going to go in on a few different areas and essentially say, well, you know what? You heard this in the past. And he's going to make it, if anything, even more strict. Like, 
He's not loosening up on the Old Testament here. He's not loosening up on these laws. He's actually tightening up on it and saying, no, we're going to have a higher standard. Now, he's not changing the law. He's just giving them more information on how they ought to be viewing the law. Right? This has always been true, and the concepts and the principles have always been true, but he's taking this. So my whole point is that people who want to say, well, Jesus did away with it. No, he didn't. No. You got to be even more strict with yourself. Let's keep, let's start reading here. Verse number 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time. Now, look, first of all, I want to make this point. Many times when he makes this statement, you've heard that it was said by them of old time. Many times it is a law and it was actually written in the Bible, but not always. Just because something was said of someone from old time, he's not saying it's written in the prophets or it's written in the law of Moses. Or, you know, sometimes he will say that too. But just be careful with what you read and don't just assume, you know, because someone might read that and say, oh, well, he's using the word of God here. He's, you know, he's referencing the word of God here. But then here it says something different. I don't remember reading that. Oh, is the, is the Old Testament now screwed up? Is it, is it corrupted because Jesus said, well, you've heard it said and, and that's not in the Bible. So now we have to you know, not trust what the Old Testament says because Jesus was talking about something and I don't know where it is. No. No, the whole reason why you don't have to worry about that is because when, you, when he's just saying, well, you've heard that it was said, he's not saying it was written in the Bible. Even though in some cases it is, right? It's, it, just take the words for what they say. Yeah, I know. Take the words for what they say, right? Verse 20, when you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. Amen. It's in the Ten Commandments. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, so you've heard that, right? Now listen to what I've got to say about that. That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of of hellfire. Now, another common theme we're going to see here also has to do with the way that you treat your brethren. Because he says here, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. And you're going to see in the next couple statements, a brother being, you no, know, not reconciled to your brother, having a brother having something. He wants the brethren to be at peace with each other. He wants us to be in unity of faith and uh, he says, you know what, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, that's a sin. You're in danger of the judgment. He's saying, yeah, of course, killing is a sin. And you're in danger of judgment by killing someone. But I'm saying, look, don't even let it get to killing. Because why do you kill someone? Because you hate them, right? Or because they did you wrong and you're, and you're going after them again, right? He's saying, before it even gets to that point, hey, you're just angry with your brother without a cause. Now you're in, in, in danger. And you just say, thou fool. You're in danger. So he's, he's, he's ramping it up and saying, be careful about all of that stuff. Because that's all a sin. Verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Now, again, he's talking about, hey, my brother, I've got, my brother's got a problem with me. And I, you just, you remember, you're, you're going to serve God. You're going to, you know, you're going to altar. You're bringing a gift. And you realize, oh man, my, you know, you're already right with God. You're bringing a gift to God. But you're going, oh wait, my brother's got something against me. He's saying, you know what? Just leave your gift right there and go and, and get things right and get them straightened out with your brother. Then come back, right, as you were. And basically what he's doing is he's stressing the importance of not letting these, these strained relationships with your brethren just continue. He said, you know what? Deal with that right away. Right. Even if you're on your way to church, you know, like, well, you know what? This is really important. I got to deal with this right now. Right. That's what he's teaching here. Now, I'm just going to bring this up. I don't know. I've only heard this from one person before. I don't know if it's a common teaching, but usually when you hear something once, it's been out there already by who, who knows how many other people might have heard this. But I've heard this verse used to justify 
that you need to get out of debt if you're in debt first before you give any tithes to God. I've heard this right now. I hope no one's heard this before or ever got, got you know, deceived by that. But that couldn't be farther from the truth because what this verse literally says, it says, leave there thy gift before the... First of all, it doesn't say it's a tithe. It's a gift. Your tithe you owe God. You pay your tithes. It's not, oh, here's a gift for you, God. No, you owe that. If you don't give it to him, the Bible says you're stealing from God. So that's not what this... First of all, for that reason alone... It doesn't, it, that's not what it's talking about. But second of all, it doesn't say, because I've heard, oh, you know, you, you're, you need to be reconciled with your brother like as if you owe him money. But that doesn't say that you owe him money. It says they have something against you. It doesn't say that you owe them money. But it's also not saying, well, take that gift and then give it to your brother and then go and, 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 and come back later and whatever. It says, no, leave your gift right there. That's still for God. Go reconcile yourself, come back, and give the gift. So it's not saying take that finances and that money and pay off your debts, and then later on you can start giving. Not at all. So, I, you know, I, like I said, maybe it's not very widespread or anything like that, and, and I hope not. But I've heard it said before, so I figured I might as well bring it up as long as we're going through this chapter. So, uh, very simple. And when you read everything in context, you can see what he's talking about. It's about having a good relationship with your brother, your brethren in Christ. Verse number 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee that thou, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. And I quoted this verse a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it again. I actually have it in my notes. Romans 12, 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So again, what he's teaching here, what I believe he's teaching in these verses, in 20, verses 25 and 26, Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in a way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. We're not going around trying to, to you know, have all these fights with people. And it's your adversary. It's not, this isn't in regards to you like doing right and standing on the word of God. This is just, you know, someone's got something wrong with you. He's saying this, make it right. Live peaceably as much as you can with all men. Just, just try to make things be at peace. And if people got problems with you, you know, you know, it's a fight over everything. Just make it work. It's what he's saying. You know, try, you know, when people just have these problems with you, I've had neighbors in the past that have had problems with me and problems with my dogs and problems with my kid. And you know what I try to do? I don't just puff up and go, uh -huh, well, it's just too bad for you and just have this butting of heads all the time. I'll try to just give in and just say, well, what, what is it that I can do? You know, I want to be a good neighbor. What's going to make you happy? Great. Okay, can we just, you know, get along? Because it's really not that big of a deal if I have to... What, whatever, I don't know, whatever the stupid things are that people get mad about. Instead of letting things escalate and, oh, now I'm going to call the cops on you and I'm going to call animal control on you and I'm going to do all this other stuff. It's like, look, we can work this out. Just live peaceably. We don't, we don't need to take this to all these levels and then, like, they're just, you know, sending you to the judge and, and then you're just going to be, you know, locked up and it's, like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. Just, just live peaceably with people. Verse 27, he continues to make things just more strict. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Amen. That's in the, that's in the Bible too. It's in the law of God. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now take this to heart, people. I believe people are committing adultery in their heart before they actually commit the act. That's where it starts. It starts in the mind. It starts in the thoughts. It starts with the eyes. 
peering and gazing on things where you ought not to be letting that happen and letting these thoughts and, and you know, this stuff just go on and on in your mind. While you may not have committed an act yet, you start doing that. You lust after women in your heart. You lust after men in your heart. You lust after this adulterous relationship. The next step is to actually do it. Now, Jesus isn't saying that actually committing adultery and committing adultery in your heart already are exactly the same and equal. But he is saying that you've committed adultery in your heart, implying that, yes, that is also a sin. So these stupid people, too, that want to say, you know, oh, well, you know, I, I could still look at the menu, right? Like, just because I've ordered doesn't mean I can't still look at the menu. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it means. Because no restaurant, well, once you make your order, they take your menu from you. <laughs> You've already ordered. There's no point. You don't, you don't look at any other choices. You've made your choice. That's it. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> Let every man have his own wife. Now, to help you, though, with this, with this lusting, because th this is a problem. And I think this is a bigger problem even than, than many may realize just because we don't really know how big of a problem it is because it's something that happens in people's minds. But considering we have so much adultery going on in general in our culture, this has to be out of control. Since we have such a culture that says it's okay for women to be walking around nude or practically nude, just, just walking around in their underwear because it's hot outside or because they're, they're swimming in a body of water, that that's okay. Well, what do you think men are going to be thinking of and lusting after when they see women practically naked? And if you're going according to Bible standards, they are naked. Because all those women that have all their thighs exposed and everything else and wearing these little tiny bikinis or whatever, they're naked. I don't care what little patch of, of garment you have covering some part of your skin. According to the Bible, you're naked. I'm not going to get into all of that. But we need to have a proper hatred for this sin. I mean, especially adultery. That you really need to learn to hate adultery. I mean, that, that ought to be just, I hate it. I want to have nothing to do with it. Because when you realize and can recognize, and, and especially men, because I think men have probably a harder time with this than women, and that Jesus uses the example of a man looking on a woman to lust after her. Men have problems with their lust in general with lusting after women. And when Jesus says, you know what, you've committed adultery in your heart. When you hate adultery, you're going to try to do something and say, you know what, I don't want to do that. Because I don't want to commit adultery in my heart. So when you hate that, it's going to force you to reevaluate and say, you know what, I need to do whatever I need to do to not do this. Like, like Job said, you know, I made a covenant with mine eyes. How then shall I look upon a maid? Covenant is a promise. You say, you know what, I, I, in my mind, I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to keep my eyes where they ought to be. And if, you know, obviously you can't control everything that comes in front of your field of vision when you're out in the world, you're going to see things. But you know, you can control the second look and the third look and, and how long you gaze, right? Those things you can control. So you see something, you recognize, you know what, I shouldn't be looking at that. Done. And you know what? That's going to help your thought life as well. And not just when you're out and about. How about when you're on the computers, when you're on the phones in a world where pornography is just blown up and is just the easiest thing probably just to get to now because it's just, it's just all out there and everyone's on the internet and you can just find whatever you want to find out there. Look, if you have problems with that, get... Get your computer out of the house. Like, just destroy it. I've said this before. I don't know if I preach this here or not, but, you know, if you have a you have problem with this stuff, destroy your stupid phone. You could live without a phone. Use someone else's phone. 
Get a dumb phone. They probably still have them. Well, you can't get on the internet. Don't get a data plan. Don't get on the wire. I mean, just, just cut it off right there. It's way better for you. And look, as fitting now, I forgot this is the next verse. Look at verse number 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. This is how, I mean, this is strong language, is it not? Do you say, you know what? If your eye is offending you, just pluck it out. I mean, just, just, just get rid of it. It's way better. Way better. Now, obviously, he's talking about being cast into hell. And if you're born again, you're, you're not going to hell. But the level of just, I mean, just after he's done saying, you know, if you look on a woman and lust after her heart, you're committing adultery with her already. And then saying, you know what, if, you're, and if your eye offends, you just pluck it out. If, you're, if you have a problem with committing adultery in your heart, take drastic measures to make sure you don't do that anymore. Get rid of the internet, the phone, whatever it is. Stop doing that. It's going to ruin your marriage. It's going to ruin. It's going to ruin your life. You say, "Oh, I was a little bit." It's going to ruin your life because it's always going to take you farther than you want to go. You you never want. You know, people think they could dabble and say, "Oh, I'm just going to look at this a little bit." Oh, I'm just going to look. Oh, what's that video? Oh, I'm going to watch that for just a little. Bit. I just want to see what that's about. And you you want to make excuses up as to why you're going to watch something? Look, just stop. Just don't do it. Just, just don't go there. And if, you, if you're having problems and you can't control yourself, then just get whatever it is away from you that's causing the problems, whether it be a computer, phone, whatever. Whatever it is, just get rid of it. Do it. You know what? That's good. As much as you think, oh, that might hurt. No, I can't do that. Yes, you can. And you ought to because it's way more profitable for you to get rid of that if you, have, if you have those types of problems. Don't play around with that. Don't play around with that. King David committed, he, he allowed himself to look on something he shouldn't have been looking on. And the longer he looked on it, he ended up acting on it. He ended up acting and committing adultery. And you know what happened? He lost four of his sons. It's a high price to pay. I bet you if you ask him if it was worth it, I don't think he'd tell you it was worth it. Not for one night of fun. Fun doing something wicked. And I don't know, because I haven't been in, in that you know, situation of something like, like that grievous being saved, but I could only imagine that it really wasn't that fun anyways. Being a child of God and committing something like that. You may be walking in the flesh, but I, can't, I couldn't imagine what the Spirit would be, <laughs> would be doing when, you know, like, like trying to follow through with something like that. So it's never, it's never worth it. It would never be worth it. It's, it's Satan's attempt at making sin just look so great and deceiving your flesh into, into wanting to have whatever it is you can't have. Walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Verse number 30, If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of my members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 31, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. This isn't a new commandment, but he's just, he's, you know, reiterating this and just expounding on this and saying, look, this is what you're actually doing. I mean, the law of Moses says that you're bound, you know, you're bound unto your wife and, you know, let, you know, what God hath joined together, let not man divide asunder. This is all common teaching, but he's just making it all the more clear and saying, look, this is actually what's happening. If you're going through this divorce and you're going to go do this, that you're going to give your wife a, a, you know, a bill of divorce or you're going to put her away, 
you're actually going to cause her then to commit adultery. Congratulations by divorcing. Now you're causing them to commit adultery. And it's your fault. That's what he's saying. You're putting them away. You're causing them to commit adultery. This is the teachings of Jesus. But the theologian today is going to tell you that, well, no, I mean, they're not really committing adultery. I mean, of course, of course there's more reasons for divorce because, you know, if someone was, if a man was looking on a woman and lusting after her, well, he committed adultery in her heart already, so that's fornication, so therefore you can get a divorce, and therefore it's, no. It's not what, that's not what he's teaching. He's breaking it down and breaking it real simple to a sinful and adulterous generation. Don't cause your spouse to commit adultery by divorcing them because unless it's the cause of fornication, which I've done an entire sermon of that recently, you're causing or commit fornication. Verse number 33, again, you have heard that it's been said of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. He's saying, hey, you know what? You've heard that if you, if you make a vow, you make an oath, then you better pay what you owe. And that's true, and that's in the Bible. It's in the scripture, absolutely. He's saying, but you know, just don't, don't vow at all. Don't make these oaths. Play it safe, man, because that's serious. Committing adultery is serious. Breaking oaths is serious. He's saying, just keep yourself from this, and here's how you do it. Live a righteous life. That's what he's teaching you to do. Verse 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. This is the attitude that a believer ought to have. Again, he's not changing the law. The law of the land in God's law is, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, you know, like that's the law. But what he's saying is don't pursue people at the law when you've been wrong. Just, just suffer it. He's saying, you know, don't resist the evil. Just, hey, man, someone hits you, just give them the other cheek also. And, uh, and if someone sues you at the law, of, you know what, here, here's my coat and, and you know, take that too. Take all my stinking money, right? Like, like whatever, just have at it. I don't care. That's not what I'm here for. It's not what I'm all about. Verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Now, and this is one of the areas where it says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Love, love thy neighbor is in the Bible, but thou shalt hate thine enemies is not in the Bible. The only time we find hatred, you know, of, of a believer or a person of God is when they're, the, the person is hating God, Right? Not your own enemies, not your own adversaries, just when people hate God, you know, the reprobates, that's who you hate. So, but people were teaching this and people were saying, hey, you know what, love your, basically love your friends, hate your enemies, right? Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And I want to caution everyone, because of all of the things that have been going on lately, because of all the focus on the reprobates and the sodomites and everything else, that we don't lose this teaching. Don't let this slip by. 
I don't want to overblow the attitude, you know, and the, and the hate against the, the sodomites, the queer, you know, the, the, the people who hate God. And allow that to become too big of a part of your life where you're starting to now apply that towards people who it's not intended to be applied towards, like your own enemies. Just because people say evil about you or smite you or despitefully use you or hate you doesn't mean that they're a reprobate. So, don't think that they are and act like they are because Jesus is saying, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. So don't get all, you know, feathers ruffled when someone hates you to where you think it's okay to hate them back. Now, the reprobates are going to hate us. But like I said, they're not the only one. So just because someone hates you, you can't just assume that they're a reprobate. You can't do it. So don't let that, don't let that spirit overtake you. Please don't. It would be better to err on the side of loving your enemy so that you're not hating people you shouldn't hate. Let's, let's I mean, keep the proper balance. Okay, I'm not saying not to do one, but definitely don't do this other one. I mean, don't, don't, don't withhold this. Verse four, because this, this is, this is a key teaching. I mean, this is, this is really important, really important in the Christian life. Verse 46, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. I don't want to see our church or any good church turn into a church that only loves people who think and believe the same way that you do and isn't loving almost everybody. <laughs> okay? And having that love in your heart to, you know what? Be able to bless people that curse you. And do good to the people that use you despitefully. They hate you and want to use you. You in turn should do good unto them. That's not easy to overcome. But if you're meek and you're humble, you can do it. Don't bow up and, and you know, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Verse 47, and if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the public and so? He said, what makes you any different? That's exactly what the world does. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's the, the, the goal, right? Try to maintain the, the attitude and the spirit of God the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't deserve that love. While, while we are just completely showing our disrespect to God by breaking his commandments and doing the things that he's told us not to do because of a severe punishment, we do them anyways. And even though we do those things, God still commends his love. And the fact that Jesus came and died on the cross for us. And Jesus himself was able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He blessed those that cursed him. Keep the right balance. Don't let your love grow cold. Because as wickedness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. We need to maintain that fervent love and do it in righteousness. And don't let the world beat you down. Hey, rejoice in, in what Jesus said about these blessings that you'll have. That's great. Take heed to what he said about, hey, don't lose your salt. Don't lose that flavor. 
don't, don't hide your light. Let it shine, man. Make it public. Just boom, be out there. Show other people. Do and teach the least of the commandments. You'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. Keep yourself pure. Don't be making areas in your life where you can just, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Well, the Bible says not to commit adultery, but I mean, I can still look. No, no. Hold the high standard. These are all the teachings that Jesus is giving us in this chapter, among many others. Let's hold to that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great teachings that, that are in your word. God, we thank you for preserving them for, uh, for us today. Pray that you please help us, teach us, guide us, Lord. Help us to, to not cover the light that you've given us, the light of the truth, the light of the gospel, the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to shine that light and to reach as many people as we can. Lord, help us to get the sin out of our own lives. Purify our hearts and our minds, dear Lord. Help us to be able to serve you better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.